Good afternoon. I'd like to welcome you to the Family Research Council. My name is Bethany Demin, and I'm the Student Interns and Lectures Coordinator here. And it's my privilege to be welcoming Senator James Lankford um, to come speak to us about religious liberty, uh, one of the very important topics of our time. Um, I just am here to do a couple of housekeeping items before I welcome our Vice President for Government Affairs to the podium to um, introduce Senator Lankford. But I just wanted to welcome all of you who are here with us and then all of you at home who are uh, joining us via live webcast. We're glad you're here. Also wanted to just remind all of you that we do uh, archive all of our videos. And so if you can share this link with um, your social media uh, friends and contacts after the lecture is over. We'd really appreciate that. It gives people a chance to also share this and also see um, these great lectures that we're able to produce here at FRC. So at this time, I'd like to welcome our own David Christensen to the podium. You don't need to applause. It's very kind of you. Thank you. Um, the title of the lecture, and the wake of Obergefell, Restraining Government, Defending Religious Liberty. Um, it's a real honor to introduce to you uh, Senator James Langford, who hails from Oklahoma. Um, I will tell you that he is one of the most articulate and intelligent uh, members, not only of the U.S. Senate, but of the uh, entire Congress. And so uh, by way of background, let me just say that he uh, did serve for four years in the House of Representatives. Uh, he was elected to the Senate November 4th, uh, 2014, to finish the remaining two years of uh, Senator Tom Coburn's term, which will end in January 2017. As chairman of the Senate Subcommittee on Regulatory Affairs and Federal Management, Senator Langford fights on un uh, unnecessary and burdensome, burdensome regulation and advocates for more restrained federal government. His personal faith, local decision-making, and opportunity for every person, regardless of their background, maybe I should say regardless of their age, are core values to Senator Langford. Before his time in Congress, a lot of people don't know this, he, uh, from I think 1995 to 2009, Senator Langford served as Director of Student Ministry at the Baptist Convention of Oklahoma and Director of Falls Creek Youth Camp, the largest youth camp in the United States with more than 51,000 individuals attending each summer. Um, Senator Langford lives in Edmond with his wife, Cindy. They have been married for over 20 years and have two daughters, Hannah and Jordan. He enjoys spending time with his family, sports shooting and reading. And hopefully during the Q&A after he speaks, he'll tell us what the theme song is that he wanted to, uh, to be introduced to. But uh, <laughs> thank you very much for being here, Senator James Langford. Yeah, David said he was going to introduce me, and I said, do you have my theme song queued up as well to make sure that's all ready to go? And then he wanted to know what it was, and I said, I, I have no idea, so I don't, I, don't, I don't really have one, so we, we can go from there. Thanks for allowing me to be a part of this conversation, and this is a big, giant national conversation that FRC should lead, and many of us that are engaged in this should continue to articulate the issues and say, what are we going to do on this most basic of American principles, uh, our first freedom, dealing with religious liberties? What does that look like? So let me give you a little bit of context in just this one year and how things have dramatically changed in the conversation. At the beginning of this year, January, February, March, during that time period, when I would speak among college students, which I often do when I'm home, and I would travel and speak in different college settings and young adults, I was asked over and over a question that puzzled me. Because at the beginning of this year, I was asked over and over again, where's your stand on religious liberty? These weren't in Christian university settings. These were in public university settings. And about the third time that I picked it up, I realized I'm in the middle of a, of a cultural transition that I was not aware of until right now. And that is among a certain segment of our society, when you say, are you for or against religious liberty? What they're really asking are, are you for or against gay marriage? <laughs> because they would say, if you're for religious liberty, then you're against gay marriage. Now this is building up to the summer and the court cases and such. We have an undercurrent of conversations happening in the country where there's become a redefinition of the term religious liberty. Is this a term that has the same meaning as we use it out in the common vernacular? And I would tell you across the country in multiple places that I've been to, no is the correct answer. This term is attempting to be redefined by our culture to say if you're for religious liberty, then your hatred towards other people, you're exclusive, uh, you are divisive, uh, you're a person that needs to be isolated because you're for religious liberty. For the sake of our country, 
and for the sake of who we have been and who we will be in the days ahead, God willing, we need to continue to stand and speak out for this most basic of principles. We are not a nation that has a freedom of worship. We're a nation that has the free exercise of religion protected, and that's incredibly important to us. That is for my faith. That is for yours. That is for another individual that shares a completely different faith or even for an individual that has no faith at all. That is protected within the United States. But it's also protected that we have the opportunity to be able to speak out on issues of faith. And it's not just to have it, but it's also the ability to be able to live it and share it. I would say to you, people of faith in the workplace and in public settings have become the new individuals that are targeted towards don't ask, don't tell. If you have faith, don't tell anyone. And don't ask anyone if you have faith. And if you have it, don't live it out publicly because people don't want to see it. Bremerton, Washington was little known to a lot of folks. A lot of people wouldn't know where Bremerton, Washington was on the map not long ago. But now a lot of people, especially people of faith, most certainly do. As a football coach, after watching a movie in 2008, was really moved to be able to just start praying for his guys after the game. He's not the head coach. He's an assistant coach. And at the end of the football games, he would kneel in the 50-yard line and thank God for his team, their protection, and to be able to pray for his boys. Pretty straightforward. Did it for a while alone. Some of his boys noticed it. They were also Christians, and they asked if they could come and join him. And his response was, it's a free country. And they could sit down, and at the end of the game, after it's over, no other responsibilities, everyone kind of hovering around the field talking and enjoying the end of the game, they could come and just for a few seconds kneel down and pray as well. Part of the football team is talking to their parents. Part of the football team is over hitting on the cheerleaders. Part of the football team is over there on the 50-yard line kneeling and praying. Fine. That's their individual choice. And that continued from 2008 all the way to the present until a person from another school district complained about it and said they were offended by it. And so the school district attorneys began to ramp up, and they set a new principle that is very interesting for us as we deal with the issue of religious liberty. The new principle that the, uh, principle that the school district set was a school district employee cannot have a visual display of faith. That's very important. They can't, no one can see you practicing your faith, because if they can see you practicing your faith, then they might take that as the school district establishment of faith. Now, take it to its logical extreme. That would mean a person that's a Muslim teacher could not wear a hijab and also teach because that is a visual display of faith. A teacher could not bow their head at their meal over the lunch table if there were students around because people might see them pray and thank God for their meal because that's a visual display of faith. A Christian teacher couldn't wear a cross necklace. A Sikh teacher couldn't wear a turban. You can go on and on and on with that. Uh, it, it, it's, an, it's an odd statement for them to make that no court has ever stood up but for this district, they're trying to push this one principle. No one can see you have faith. In addition to that, my favorite part of what the school district offered was this unique thing. They said, if you as a person of faith want to pray, we will provide you a place where you can privately go pray. Literally saying, the government will show you where you can pray and when you can pray. Just let that soak in for a minute. I don't, think the, I don't think the staff really want to say that, but that's really what they said. If you'll pray in a place and time of our choosing, we're okay with you praying. But if you don't pray at a place and time of our choosing, then we're not okay with it. That does not sound like the free exercise of religion to me. Universities around the country are dealing with a new norm right now as well. University in my state this year closed married student housing closed it, understanding full well that there were gay students that would apply to the school and would immediately say, I want to get into married student housing because of the oncoming onslaught of lawsuits that they knew they would face and where they were as a school, they chose to just say, we won't offer married student housing at all. Now, I don't criticize them for that. They're trying to figure out how do we actually function under a nebulous new court ruling and where do we process. Other universities in my state that are Christian universities stepped up and said, no, we're going to continue to offer married student housing, and we're going to continue to press through this and evaluate it. Four universities in my state uh, are a part of a larger lawsuit that you will often hear as Little Sisters of the Poor lawsuit, uh, which, again, 
President Obama could not have picked a better group to go sue and drag in front of court than the Little Sisters of the Poor and say, President Obama versus this group of nuns. To drag them in front of court and to be able to say, no, you can't practice your faith in the workplace unless it's how I define your faith. Of that seven entities that are in that, four of those are from my state. Uh, Southern Nazarene University, Mid-America Bible College, uh, Oklahoma Baptist University, and Oklahoma Wesleyan University. They've all said that the Obamacare mandates and, uh, that come down on them violate their faith. And they're going to walk up to the Supreme Court in March and have oral arguments to discuss that. So then the conversation on, on religious uh, liberty continues to press on all these issues. So let me give you just a couple of thoughts and let me open this up for questions. And let's open this up and we can just sky's the limit on it. Two things. One is, for whatever reason, this generation has become afraid of faith we should challenge people of faith to live their faith. Not in a bold, brash way, just to practice your faith. I tell people all the time, if you have faith, live it. If you say you have a faith, but you really don't live it, you don't have a faith, you have a hobby. There's a big difference between a faith and a hobby. A hobby is something you do occasionally on weekends when you get time. A faith permeates everything that you do. If you have faith, live your faith. That is the best thing that we can challenge people of faith to do in our society. The second thing is, for those of us that are people of faith, for some reason we've got our heads down all the time, depressed about what we're losing, and we lose track of what we have. For those of us that are people of faith, we have a tremendous amount in our personal relationship with Christ, with our personal walk with God. It deeply impacts us. We understand what redemption looks like. We understand what grace looks like. We understand what it's like to be an impact on society. And for me and my faith, I understand full well when Jesus said, if you're struck on one cheek, turn the other cheek. If you're forced to go one mile, go two. That's not a sign of weakness. That's a point of strength to say, you cannot take this away from me. You may try to show your power over me, but let me show you who's still in control. Because though you force me to go one, I'll smile at you and go two. And in your shock, you'll try to figure out, I thought I was going to dominate you. And instead, you're actually controlling me. There's something very powerful when we actually live our faith according to basic biblical principles. I'm stunned by the number of believers. And again, I'm coming from my own faith perspective. But a number of believers that I encounter that try to accomplish God's purposes with man's means. Let's do God's things, God's ways, and let's find out how that works. I bet it's a fairly effective model. Now, again, in a nation like ours, no one's required to have faith. No one's required to have a certain faith. Uh, I get to remind people all the time about Article 6 of the Constitution. For some reason, so many great folks only think about uh, the first three articles that define the legislative branch, the executive branch, and the judicial branch. But flip to the back of of the Constitution, not to the amendments, the appendices, Flip to the back of it, Article 6. It says there's no religious test for any officer in the United States. Any person elected anywhere in the United States doesn't have a religious requirement to be in any denomination, nor do they have to set aside their belief in any faith. People that are elected and people serve across the country, it's very important. If they walk into that office and have faith, live it. It's protected under the United States Constitution for you to be able to do that. And that is consistent for every person in every phase of government. We're not going to ram that down people's throat, but neither will I have this country be declared the official religion of atheism, and only those that practice it can practice it publicly. Those of us that practice our faith can still practice it publicly, even if our faith is an atheism. So let me take some questions from you. What would you all like to talk about? All right, first question is always the hardest. If this question goes bad, the whole thing goes back. We'll, so. we'll, we'll wait to the uh, the song until later. Um, <laughs> so you're talking about practicing your faith in the in the public square, encouraging others as well. Uh, and you're a United States senator. Can you maybe touch a little more on how you walk in line with faith uh, within your work environment? Um, just touch on that a little more. Yeah, thanks. Um, I, I I live my faith here just like I did at home, and just like I still do at home by the way, when I fly back and forth each week. Uh, that, that hasn't changed for me. 
Uh, my faith permeates how I treat people, how I speak, how I drive, how I interact with staff, how I interact with people that I disagree with, how I inter- interact with my daughters or with my bride. Th- that's just part of who I am. So it should permeate every part of that. And if there's a part of it that's not affected, that needs to be fixed. That's a gap in my own faith. That also means it affects how I interact with people that I disagree with on the Senate floor. And there are quite a few that we disagree on issues. I should be able to strongly advocate for policy areas where clearly I'm right and clearly they're wrong. Okay, I should be able to advocate for those things in such a way that doesn't demean and belittle them so that at the end of that conversation, again, this is coming from my faith perspective, I want to strongly advocate for policy issues, but at the end of it still be able to tell them about how much God loves them and has a plan for their life. That I don't become so personal and belittling in an argument about an issue that I disallow myself to also speak about faith to that person. So those two things come together for me. For me, coming from a faith perspective, I have a track and a mission that's a part of who I am. I also have a legislative responsibility. I believe, personally for me, I believe the more effective legislator I am, the more opportunities that I have to actually speak about my faith. If I'm a terrible legislator, no one would take my faith seriously. But if I'm a quality legislator and take on the issues, it also opens up a platform to talk about the rest of my life. And I've had that opportunity with multiple members uh, of the Senate, and of the House, and of other staff. And we choose to live that out. We have, and y'all are welcome uh, to be able to attend at some point if you want to be able to connect with us. Uh, we do quarterly prayer walks uh, in the Capitol uh, late in the evening uh, where we go on the Senate floor and gather around the desks that are there and just pray over the senators over each desk. Uh, we go onto the House floor and just sit in the chairs and be able to pray for the House members. Uh, we go to different spots in uh, the old Supreme Court chamber and uh, pray for the members of the Supreme Court and then go to either Statuary Hall or out on the Speaker's balcony and be able to pray for the White House, the Cabinet, uh, and for the Capitol Police and the folks that are around this town that work so incredibly hard for us. That's a part of who we are as just people of faith. We really believe that prayer is not a decorative thing. It's a part of what we do. Uh, it's also one of the issues uh, when you deal with things like this coach. Um, I, I have a, an op-ed piece coming out soon that'll that'll just talk about it. If the, if the coach kneeled down, if a player was hurt on the field, and that same coach would have kneeled on the sideline and prayed, no one would have batted an eye. But because he prayed when things were going good, that suddenly became offensive to people. So now culture is trying to say there's certain times that it's appropriate to pray. It's not true. So it's the same for me as it is for you and anyone else here. If you have a person of faith, You're in America. You can live your faith. No one's going to push back on that. And if they do, we need to push back on that principle and say, no, you can't. That's a long answer, but. Yes, ma'am. They're going to bring a microphone to you. I think they're going to need it for the kajillion people online watching right now. (laughs) You spoke about the redefinition of religious freedom. And... um, Did you just discover that in talking with the people, the definition that they were? uh, I did, actually. In my ongoing conversation, I kept probing them because it seemed interesting the way they were asking what they were asking. To ask me a question like, are you a person that believes in religious liberty? was kind of an interesting question to ask me in Oklahoma. And so I would ask them back, tell me why you say that. And it was coming back consistently that this was really about gay marriage. Uh, It was really code. Uh, to say if you believe in religious liberty, then that means you're anti-gay marriage. Uh, so that that's one of those many things I bring up to our group to say we, we have to make sure that people hear what we're saying. I noticed that when my husband and I were in Israel, uh, I couldn't figure out why the Jewish uh, people and many Europeans uh, consistently, when it came to our U.S. elections, were always uh, supportive of the more liberal candidate. And I asked when we were there, and it was the same redefinition issue. When they heard conservative, they thought of the more tyrannical figures. So I wonder how that mindset can be reversed, because the redefinition is really a per progressive goal. Right, it is. With the language. It, it cha- changing the terms and changing the meanings. There are a couple things. For those of us that are conservatives, we've got to make sure conservatism is based on ideas, not on volume. I do have folks in my state uh, that will say to me, when someone's ranting and raving and just screaming at somebody, they'll say to me, well, that's a real conservative. I'll always stop them and go, whoa, hold on. 
conservatism is not about volume. It's about ideas. And at the moment, the angriest person is the strongest conservative. We've lost the battle because we are about ideas that work in every community, in every race, among every age. It's a set of ideas that work and that are valuable, that honor people in the process. So that's incredibly important to us in how we articulate the issues. Uh, for me, again, as, as a conservative, it comes from that perspective. Second thing is when you brought up Europe on it, I want to just bring this up on the religious liberty issue. Europe, uh, th this is just something I see that will occur. We're going to fight it as well as a nation. Europe will have an anti-Muslim backlash immediately. And it will suddenly become suspicion of every neighbor that are around you. And my suspicion of how Europe will respond to that will be to start trying to pass laws and rules saying there can't be any conversion and there has to be less public display. Because that seems to be Europe's model is to say, okay, everybody calm down. It's these religious people that cause these problems, so every religion needs to calm down and just turn down for everyone. And you'll get things like anti-conversion laws, and you'll get things like that that would fly in the face of us. Uh, already, if you're uh, and this has been true for several years, but if you're going into the U.K. as a missionary, it's very expensive and very difficult. And we don't think of England as an area that blocks out missionaries, but you can't get into the U.K. as a missionary without a lot of expense and a lot of paperwork. And if you show up in the U.K. as a student mission trip and they find out you're a mission trip there, they'll turn you back at the airport and we'll fly you back home and we'll say you don't have the right paperwork. This is in England. So th th this will be a pervasive issue. I would tell you, we in America have to be very cautious as well on how we speak about Islam. We are a country where all faiths are allowed, all faiths. Just because someone is a Muslim doesn't mean they're a terrorist. We honor all faiths as, as a government, but that also means I still have the ability to be able to share and live my faith. I'm not intimidated by other faiths, quite frankly, because I think I'm right, okay? They're going to live their faith because they think they are, but they're really not I am. Okay, so, <laughs> so as, as we walk through all that, that's a part of living out your faith. So we, we have to be cautious that we are adamantly opposed to Islamic extremist terrorism, no question about it. The terrorists that are coming out are not uh, – they are clearly Islamic terrorists. This particular group of Sunni Islam that's rising up, calling out a caliphate, uh, they're looking for people to have their particular brand around the world and calling them out. It's, it's clearly a religious movement, but that doesn't mean all religion is bad. Um, yes, ma'am. I know that you're a co-sponsor of the First Amendment Defense Act, which I we am. really appreciate. And um, I'm just wondering what your thoughts are with regard to um, whether conscience protections and religious freedom should apply to for-profit businesses um, and whether they should be able to protect their consciences um, or that should just be narrowly protecting uh, nonprofits. So there's a tiny little craft store based in my state called Hobby Lobby. <laughs> They uh, laid down a marker, and I was so incredibly proud of how the family handled this. Uh, many people don't know the Hobby Lobby story. They really did start in Bethany, Oklahoma, in the garage just several decades ago as a tiny little family business uh, where Steve Green, who's now running the company, was the kid in the garage cutting out little frames to be able to put frames together in their family frame shop. They've gone from that to a very large company who's impacting people around the area. They're still functioning their company with the same principles that they started with in their family's garage. It's still the same. Christian music play over the loudspeakers. They're closed on Sundays. They close early on Wednesdays. I mean, they, they, they're very family friendly in the way they function their, their company. That's their core value. What the Supreme Court tried to say to them, to Hobby Lobby specifically, was I understand you practice your business by faith principles. You can do that if you're small, but if you get bigger than 50, the rules change and you have to practice faith by our principles. And what Hobby Lobby was able to do was to push back on that and say, just because you're big, it doesn't mean that the rules change on you. I try to reinforce the same way. Just because you're an individual in a business doesn't mean you lose your Second Amendment rights. Just because you're a large company doesn't mean you lose the right to free press or free assembly. Why is it as a business that you suddenly lose the freedom of religion just because you're in business? You don't. That's still the same. You don't lose other rights when you're a business. You don't lose that one either. Yes, sir. Senator, um, after the 
June decision when the court decided they knew better than thousands Every of years state, of history and, and, and yeah, yeah. you know all of that. Yeah. Um, many of us were looking to see the response of Congress, an equal branch of government, mm -hmm. to say to the court, "You got it wrong." Um, is FADA supposed to do that, or is there some other means that Congress can speak as an equal branch of government to say the court got this issue wrong? I would say Congress is split, and this is going to be a ballpark. I've not whip-checked this. I bet Congress is split about the same amount that the Supreme Court is split right now, 5-4, the wrong way. And some of the challenges that were faced by many of us that believe marriage is to be defined clearly by the states. Uh, I, I, I like to say to folks, I completely agree with Justice Kennedy, the Justice Kennedy of two years ago, <laughs> that said two years ago, marriage is a state issue. And was very clear on the Defense of Marriage Act. And as he wrote out the Defense of Marriage Act, this, the federal government has to honor gay marriages in states if they've been ratified by the states because marriage is a state issue. And then two years later, he comes back and says, just kidding, it's a federal issue. And, and, and so it's this odd dichotomy between the two different opinions. So I agree with Justice Kennedy two years ago, not the recent one. Uh, saying that, there's a large group of folks in Congress that would say one of two things. The Supreme Court spoke on this, I'm going to back off. <clears throat> or this is a settled issue, I'm not going to get into this fight. Uh, this will be a long-term a long-term conversation as a nation. I have reminded many folks in my state that agree, that disagree with me that the Supreme Court felt that they solved uh, abortion in Roe v. Wade. They most certainly have not. This generation is more pro-life than their parents. Uh, so this is not a settled issue in America. And the way the Supreme Court settled this, it will not be a settled issue 40 years from now. What is unresolved and what will be the unpacking now, and I think it will be first in the universities, is trying to force universities to be able to give up faith principles. And, the, and the, the weapons that they have in their toolbox for the federal government is accreditation, is Pell Grants, and student loans. They have all three of those weapons in their toolbox and say, if you don't do X, Y, Z at your university and recognize X, Y, Z, we'll take away accreditation, student loans, and Pell Grants, and your university shut. Very few universities could survive that. Uh, we see that right now in the, in the uh, Cal State system. Uh, where in California, starting last year, Sarah, this was starting last year, wasn't it? A year and a half ago, the Cal State system. Uh, they determined uh, in California that if you're a religious club or any club, quite frankly, on campus, your leadership had to be open to any opinion, including about sexuality. So for a Christian organization, it wasn't membership, it was your leadership also had to be open to people of all views on sexuality. Well, Christian organizations immediately backed up and said that violates our faith principles and who we are. And they said, well, you're free to be on campus. You just can't get a room here on campus. You can't have official announcements on campus, but you're free to be here, but you can't be an official club unless you, you tote the official California line that leadership can also include this. So many of those organizations either stopped functioning on campus and functioned off campus or had to go back and rework their constitution of their organization to try to figure out how to be able to word this so they could still operate on campus. That's the kind of stuff that accelerates now after this summer's decision. It's the, yes, you can have any opinion you want as long as it's ours. <laughs> we have time for one more? All right, now that's the final question. Just as much pressure as the first question. <laughs> I'll try to make it good. <laughs> um, I handle the life issues here in our government affairs department, and this summer um, you spoke a lot on the floor about the the videos that came out, um, the Planned Parenthood uh, scandals that were going on. And every time I've heard you speak, including now, I always see optimism. Um, I think to the general public, it's hard to find a reason to be optimistic when we see uh, Republicans controlling both the House and the Senate, and yet we're not being able to defund Planned Parenthood or mm -hmm. those sorts of things. And I was just wondering what you would say to the general public about expectations um, what, and how you, as a senator, um, stay optimistic. Okay, that's a good thing. Um, one is my hope is not in government. 
Uh, I do believe that God is unpacking something in our nation um, and that it's significant. The other one, I, I see the trends, trend lines moving. Uh, and though there's great frustration with what's not done, I do see the movement. You go back to 2011, it was the last time there was a Planned Parenthood vote in the Senate. We lost that vote by 18. We then had that same vote again, uh, slightly different language, but pretty close. Uh, first week of August of this year, we lost that vote really by five. Uh, we had one member that would have voted with us that was out, and then McConnell had to switch his vote so he could bring it back up again at any time. Uh, that procedural uh, vote change. So we went from losing it by 18 to losing it by five in four years. That's a pretty big shift that's already occurring. Uh, uh, Planned Parenthood's on the defensive. And what I tried to push back in my state was, this is not about Planned Parenthood. That's the shiny object. The issue is really about children. Okay, Planned Parenthood's just the single largest provider of abortion in the country. And we can talk about Planned Parenthood all you want, but defunding Planned Parenthood just moves people that are pursuing abortion to other places. We really need to deal with the life of children. That part of it, when I speak to many groups of students, they're more pro-life than you would expect. They see the ultrasounds. Uh, they understand the technology of it. Uh, I have a friend of mine, which I've spoken about often, her, uh, their little girl, Violet, who was born at 14 ounces and is now a year and a half old and is doing great. That, that didn't happen before. When I bring up Violet's story to someone, I was like, that's exactly the child that Planned Parenthood is harvesting. Exactly the child at 14 ounces. That little girl is right there. You can see her. This little girl was chopped up and sold. Are you okay with that? And people aren't, on the whole, okay with that individually. So I see a movement that's happening in the country uh, that takes time. Uh, we as Americans, there's a pretty big shift in it. And it takes a lot of time to be able to move a nation like ours. Um, I do remind people that uh, the um, Obamacare bill, when it passed in the Senate just six years ago, 60 Democrats voted for that in the Senate. Only 32 of them are still left in the Senate six years later. Now, again, we don't notice that shift. The shift has already started. And I have some optimism about where we're going and how we can get there. Will it be easy? No. It's not going to be easy. It's not easy already. But we're making progress. And for me, I keep my eye on the horizon, understanding that there are different days that are, that are tougher than others, and there's some great frustration on legislation. And I can articulate several of them to you in the last two weeks that have been really frustrating days for us internally in the office, saying this was a day we could have gotten something done, and for whatever reason, it wasn't picked up, and we gotta, we got to figure this out. So I get that. But you just try to keep the long look on it. And somewhat, it's still driven by faith uh, for me. Uh, if there is a God in heaven and he really does care about us, then maybe he has a plan as well. And uh, I, should, I should try to spend more time praying than I should do griping. And my concern is, is that we get so caught up in the political culture, we spend more time griping than we do solving and praying. So maybe there's a need to shift. David, thanks for allowing me to be here and be a part of this conversation. Keep up the great work.